too many to all of us use the, the Wi-Fi, so please use it sparingly. Um, so welcome to Ezier, and uh, welcome in the name of the LabEx Bezu. Um, I will not say very much about data science in terms of introduction. I just want to explain our motivations in organizing this event. Um, um, the need for, for data science and massive data analysis in a number of fields and uh, in web technologies, in healthcare applications, and others uh, call for uh, even more uh, collaborations between scientists of different disciplines and uh, researchers and people from the industry and, and this more than, than before. Um, what is new from the point of view of the industry is that the, the type of um, techniques that are needed to process and analyze uh, large amounts of data uh, require fairly quickly uh, techniques that um, are, no, are known at the research level, uh, but, but for some of them, uh, for techniques that are still in the making um, in computer science and, and applied mathematics. Uh, what is new from the point of view of researchers is, of course, uh, uh, a set of new problems, but also new perspective on problems we thought we knew and we thought we had solved, um, but where, where we have a new perspective. Uh, and one special feature, which is that, you know, this massive amount of data is uh, necessary to work a little bit on the applied side, at least, of these problems, and that without access to it, it's, it's difficult to do research, and that by nature, it is uh, difficult to manipulate and to access. Um, and so, for all of these reasons, we felt it was useful to reach out and uh, bring together people working both in uh, academia, I mean, working in academia and in the industry, um, and that are interested by the, the state of the art. And uh, that means that we hope for this day, um, beyond uh, the talks that I'm looking forward to and, and that I think will be uh, very interesting, um, that it will be a, a day for exchange. Um, I think this is one of the, the goals and will be successful in if, if we can think this is uh, achieved. Before we start, I want to say a few words about the LabEx Bezu, uh, who's the of official organizer of, of this event. Uh, the LabEx Bezu is the Laboratoire uh, d'Excellence uh, Bezu that federates the laboratories of uh, research in computer science and mathematics of uh, Université Paris-Est. Paris so uh, that is Université Paris-Est Marne-la-Vallée, Université Paris-Est Créteil, École des Ponts Paris Tech, and Ezier. Um, there are three laboratories, the LIGM, Laboratoire d'Informatique Gaspard Monge, uh, the CERMIX, the Centre d'Enseignement et de Recherche en Mathematiques et Calcul uh, Scientifique, which is based mainly at École des Ponts, and the LAMA, which is the Laboratoire d'Analyse et de Mathematiques Appliquées, uh, which is between UPEM and UPEC uh, mainly. Um, so, I'll try and, and do the difficult exercise to give you a sense of some of the uh, research uh, that is done in this LabEx. So this is uh, the work of more than 200 people, including researchers and PhD students. Um, and I'll uh, emphasize a little more maybe on some themes that are more closely related to uh, data science. So we have research in uh, discrete mathematics on formal models, syntactic method, and uh, harmonic analysis and multifractal systems. So that's the work of uh, uh, Stéphane Jaffard, Bernard Aust, Romain Dujardin. Um, and uh, we have applications in bioinformatics linguistics um, on the semantic web. Uh, a second large topic is about images, geometry, 3D, and computer vision. So there is, uh, on one hand, uh, work at the intersection of 3D imaging and discrete geometry, and also work on 3D uh, vision and large-scale reconstruction of environment. That's work of Michel Coupry, Laurence Wirth, and the Imagine team. Um, uh, there is uh, a topic uh, of interest in high-dimensional phenomena, uh, in particular on large random matrices, uh, with work of Philippe Loubaton, Jamal Najim, and Alain Pajor, with uh, many applications which I will not mention. Um, there is work in stochastic and deterministic uh, modeling, so stochastic processes, um, some application to finance, random trees, and so on. I, I won't get into the detail. Uh, there are a number of people in different parts of the LabEx that are interested in optimization, and, and in particular in large-scale optimization, which is relevant for big data problems. 
uh, and all kinds of optimization from uh, uh, high dimensional sparse optimization uh, with the, the research of uh, people working around Jean Christophe Pesquet and Hugues Talbot, um, large um, stochastic system uh, with the work of Jean Philippe Chancelier, uh, Michel Delara, and combinatorial optimization. Um, so that's a lot of areas, and you notice that uh, quite a few of them have connections with, uh, with data science. Um, I want to mention in particular the fact that the LABEX takes part in uh, a projet d'investissement d'avenir, which is the Absent project on high throughput sequencing of the genome. And uh, this is led here by Grégory Kucherov. So the, the LABEX is involved in a quite a number of research directions that are related to data science. And um, data science is, however, very broad. It was difficult for us to uh, make the choice of which topic to, to, to cover. And so instead of trying to, be, uh, to make a general coverage, which was hard, uh, we decided to focus on a couple of things. Um, and so, I mean, if I have to try and, and make explicit what are these things, um, maybe it's more on the man massive uh, data analysis side, which is the second part of the title of this day. And so I think a number of the talks that we'll hear will be on scalability issues um, that can be um, associated with uh, techniques for math and, and uh, algorithms, uh, and also on, on the, what can be done with large amounts of, of data, in particular on uh, extracting representations, and we'll, we'll hear about that. Um, so um, without further ado, um, I will uh, leave uh, the pleasure to my uh, co-organizer, uh, co Laurent Najman, who is professor in computer science here at Ezier, to introduce uh, Yann Lequin, and uh, I wish you an excellent uh, colloquium. Thank you. Okay, so. Do I need to present Jan Lequin? Do I really need to present him? You all know that he is the director of AI research of Facebook, and this is probably one of the reasons why you are here. This guy is so well known that the day he was hired by Facebook the stocks of the company rise up by a non-negligible amount, which is an inter interesting fact. You may also have noticed that he is a professor at NYU, Grand Institute of Mathematical Science. At NYU, he is the founding director of the Center for Data Science, a research and education institution focused on the automatic extraction of the knowledge from data and on the application of massive data analysis to science, medicine, business, and government. So you know that Jan is a pioneer in the field of machine learning, artificial neural networks, and pattern recognition. In the 90s, he proposed one of the early versions of the backpropagation algorithm, the most popular method for training artificial neural network. In the late 80s and early 90s, he was at ATT Bell Labs Laboratories, where he developed the convolutional network model, a pattern recognition model whose architecture mimics, in part, the visual cortex of animals and humans. The interesting fact is that, that the technique worked. It worked so well that at and eventually deployed a check reading system based on this breakthrough that by the late 90s was reading about 20% of the old checks uh, written in the US. It is also interesting to know that he was working there with people like Leon Boutou, Corinna Cortez, who is now the head of Google Research at New York, Vladimir Vap Vapnik, and Isabel Guillon. These last two persons invented the support vector machine technique at that time. While at and uh, Jan made a series of breakthroughs in the area of machine learning, VLSI design and image processing, including the co-creation of Deja Vu system, a technology and computer file format designed to distribute scanned documents over the internet. So Jan is one of the leading scientists behind the recent search of interest in deep learning, the latest development in artificial intelligence in which researchers aim to emulate human auditory and visual systems. The curious things about deep learning networks is that they work but they are a bit like the human mind. They work, but we do not really know the reason why they are working so well. This restrained the development of the technology for years, especially at some universities. 
But this is not a problem for companies that need to solve problems. Deploying methods, particularly convolutional networks, are used for a wide variety of applications, including speech and image recognition by companies such as Google, NEC, Microsoft, IBM, Baidu, and Facebook. But these facts, you probably knew most of them. The day is devoted to knowledge extraction, so I will tell you some little-known facts. A little-known fact is the reason why he joined Facebook. Well, Jan is an amateur of technolo technological bets. Vladimir Vapnik uh, made, uh, for example, uh, a famous bet while Jan was present. Uh, he said that by 2000, no one in the right mind of state will be using neural networks. Uh, in September 2013, Jan bet a fantasy dinner that by 2023, so 10 years from now, smartphones will be able to drive cars on any street safely. As, as, as Jan does not like to lose, he quickly found a way to help solving the problem simply by founding the Facebook AI Research Lab, whose main goal is to solve AI, yet, but to solve AI to make smartphones smarter so that they, we, they can drive a car and so that he can win his bet. But my take-home message today for this presentation is the following. Jan has been in a number of great places, at the Ben Labs, NYU, Facebook. Indeed, Jan has a knack for choosing the best place to be. But if Jan is who he is, this is because he attended this very school, Essier Paris, when he was still of an age to be impressed by professors. Yes, in the field of learning theory is what it is, if the field of learning theory is what it is today, it is because of Jan, and thus, and thus largely because he is a former student of SCA Paris. I was not there at the time, but some of his former teachers are there in this room, which proves it was not so long ago. Uh, Jan told me that the back propagation was invented while he was studying at SCA Paris. So what we can really say that this is the place where everything started. Uh, another little known fact is that Jan majored from the electronic system department, uh, not from the computer science department. Uh, well, this department did not exist at the time, but uh, anyway, Jan did exactly as Steve Jobs. He picked a field of study remotely related to the field he was going to change. So he could tell you that you have to choose what you think is the best, as Steve Jobs uh, famously said once. So welcome back, Jan. Welcome back to the place where everything started. And so Jan, recent research project include the application of deep learning uh, to visual scene, scene understanding, visual navigation for autonomous uh, ground robots, driverless cars, and small flying robots. I think his speech is going to describe all of that and with illustration, nice illustration. Thank you, Jan. introduction while we fumbled with the connectors here. Everything was true. Everything was uh, true except for the reason I joined Facebook. That actually was not to win this bet. All right, so it's, it's a real pleasure to be uh, back, although I can't really say back because when I was at SCA, um, I moved out of SCA. I did my PhD um, um, in an office at SCA, but it was in Paris, and the school moved here right after I left, and so I actually never worked in this building. Um, but I worked with a lot of people who were here, uh, sitting here. I took, I took courses from them and shared offices with them. Uh, and um, some of them are professors here now. Uh, they were students at the time. 
So um, it's actually quite a bit, quite a long time ago. Uh, a few months ago, I came back uh, to ACA for the 30th anniversary of our, our uh, promo. Um, so it's been 30 years, over 30 years, that I graduated from from here. I had a great time uh, in this school. It was uh, it was a wonderful time for for the school, and I'm sure it's even better now. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, deep learning, and some of the stuff I'm going to talk about actually indeed has its roots all the way back to when I was uh, studying at, at ETA and working on projects uh, a lot with the uh, uh, mathematics professors and who were nice enough to kind of uh, let us work on, on projects we were interested in uh, as, as opposed to things that we were supposed to work in, to work on, and um, that allowed me to think about AI and machine learning and stuff like that back when I was in third year uh, at ACA. And it started my interest for this and uh, decided afterwards to do a PhD and everything. Um, so I want to uh, thank the, my, my uh, former professors, particularly the, the mathematics professors. Many of them have retired. I, I don't think I've, I, see, I don't see any of them here, but, um, but it was a wonderful time. So, um, Speaking of history, let me go back a little further up in history in the 50s. I wasn't even born. Uh, but if you look at pattern recognition back in the 50s, uh, and you look at pattern recognition systems nowadays, they're very similar in many ways. Uh, they're based on uh, a very simple architecture where you, you take an input, you uh, feed it to a feature extractor, which is mostly built by hand, engineered, and then uh, uh, this feature extractor is, is meant to eliminate all the irrelevant transformations of the uh, irrelevant uh, variabilities in the input and preserve the useful information, and then you feed that to a classifier, which generally is trainable. And this goes back to the perceptron model, which you see a picture of at the, at the bottom here. On the left, you see the uh, camera, which is really a, an array of photo sensors. Uh, in the middle is the feature extractor, uh, which looks like a spaghetti plate. These are random connections from pixels to uh, threshold gates, essentially, that are implemented in analog circuits. Um, the joke I usually said is that uh, we, we've replaced the, the spaghetti plate of wires by spaghetti code now, but it's still, it's still the same, uh, same nature of things. And then on the right, you see the classifier, and each of the modules you see is a, a variable weight that can be trained using the perceptron algorithm. So, in fact, modern pattern recognition systems have, are a little bit more sophisticated. Instead of having two stages, they have three stages. Uh, the first one being built by hand. The second one is generally trained in an unsupervised manner, although not always. Um, and the role of the middle uh, module is to take the feature vector and expand its dimension in a nonlinear way so as to make it high dimensional and sparse. The reason for this is that once you do this, uh, things become more easily separable. And um, so in speech recognition systems, this is, this is done using a mixture of Gaussian model. In, in modern uh, speech recognition systems, actually, this is done by deep learning, but we'll come to this in a minute. And then the classifier is basically a linear classifier that just combines the scores coming out of those uh, Gaussians. In the case of vision, until a few years ago, the standard model was handcrafted features, uh, such as uh, SIFT and HOG, followed by a feature expansion uh, using sparse coding or, or k-means uh, vector quantization. Uh, followed by some sort of spatial pooling operation that aggregates the, the, the sparse vectors and then followed by, by the classifier. So that's a very, very standard pipeline. All of these are being replaced by what's at the bottom, which is essentially a sequence of trainable modules. Uh, those modules are, are trainable with a, a, uh, a generally a combination of unsupervised and supervised learning. And the role of each module is to transform its input into a slightly higher level uh, representation where the useful information is preserved and the irrelevant information is uh, suppressed. So, and so as the data goes, uh, or the, the, uh, the information goes from layer to layer, the uh, uh, abstraction level of, of that representation goes up and up. So this uh, creates the idea of hierarchical representations, which is the very idea of deep learning. But the main problem of this is that, or the main problem that deep learning attempts to solve is how to train this whole thing at once uh, so as to not rely on handcrafted features and so as to kind of make sure each module plays the role it's supposed to, to play with respect to the others. So a typical example for image recognition 
is uh, something like this, where you would have um, low-level features that essentially extract very simple motifs like uh, oriented edges or color contrast. So you see some examples of typical uh, patterns on the left here that could be extracted by low levels. And then those features are assembled so that um, uh, higher level features like motifs uh, are detected at the following levels. And then as you go up the layers, you, you see detectors that react to entire objects or categories or parts of objects or even uh, scene categories. Um, so I lifted those visualizations from uh, my colleague Rob Fergus, who, who's worked on a method to visualize the state of a convolutional net, which I'll come back to in a minute. So this idea of hierarchy is not uh, just applicable to image recognition, but it also applies to things like text, where you have similar hierarchies from character to word to word groups, clauses, sentences, etc., to speech, of course, where you have sample, spectral band sounds, elementary sounds like subphones, uh, phones, phonemes, words, etc. So uh, there is the sense that the natural world can be understood by elementary uh, categories that can be assembled into slightly less elementary categories uh, where uh, variabilities can be uh, eliminated. And so the, the problem of training those architectures is, is not a new one. Um, in fact, you know, I've been obsessed with this question since I was a student here, actually. And it's, it's, it's not just how do we train a classifier, it's how, how do we learn representations of the perceptual world. And it's a question that people have been asking themselves in computer science, of course, and engineering. Uh, but it's also a question that people have, have been asking themselves in neuroscience and cognitive science. How does the brain, uh, by observing the world, essentially uh, trains itself to interpret uh, images and sounds and things like this? And there's a lot of evidence that much of this is, is learned in the, in, in, the, in the brain. So one of the, one of the things that deep learning uh, tries to address is, is you know, is there a single algorithm that can train a complex machine to learn representations and, and, and classifications at the same time? And one of the hopes in the long run is perhaps by uh, finding such algorithms from the kind of more mathematical theoretical side of things, uh, we might have some hints about how to explain how, how the brain functions. So if you look at the visual cortex, the visual cortex is indeed hierarchical. Um, and there are some... Uh, uh, evidence that a lot of some of the processing that we do uh, when, when we perceive uh, um, an image is relatively simple in the sense that it's feed forward. So the signal goes from the retina to uh, the base of the brain, lateral geniculate nucleus, to uh, V1 in the back of the brain, V2, V4, etc. Uh, and there's this sort of hierarchy where the, the signal goes from stage to stage, very much like the uh, uh, deep architecture I was, I was uh, showing earlier. And because the process is very fast, the uh, hypothesis is that there is very little feedback. So it's mostly a feed-forward process for recognizing everyday object. Of course, there is a lot of tasks that the visual cortex does which involve um, inference. So it involves kind of thinking about things and figuring out uh, how to interpret images. But some of the simple tasks we do every day are essentially feed-forward. In fact, it happens in less than 100 milliseconds in the visual cortex. So... It's a simplifying assumption that a lot of us are, have been jumping on, of course, to build our, our system. So it's nice to be, in, to be uh, inspired by biology, but we have to be careful. And there is a, a story I tell. I always have to explain when I give a talk in the US or, or outside France who Clément Adair is. Uh, uh, so maybe for the non-French people in the audience, uh, since you are in Paris, if you get a chance, go to the uh, uh, Musée du Conservatoire National des Arts et Métiers in Paris. It's a wonderful museum, uh, museum of technology, basically. And it's got a reproduction of this uh, airplane, uh, which was called the avion, which is the word that we use in French to designate an airplane. And so Clément Adair is the, considered the father of aviation in France. And he was the guy who built uh, the first airplane that took off under its own power uh, 13 years before the Wright brothers. In fact, the Wright brothers' airplane didn't take, take off by its own power. Uh, it had to be catapulted. But anyway, this, um, this airplane was a failure, essentially. Uh, it had no follow-ups. Nobody got inspiration from, from, from this guy for two reasons. The first one is um, he tried to copy biology too closely, and so he modeled his, his plane after bats without really thinking very much about things like stability and control. Um, and so his plane could take off, but was uncontrollable and basically crashed after just 50 meters. And the second thing is that uh, he was very secretive and didn't want to talk to anyone about it, um, and nobody knew about it. 
So it was always a controversy whether it's playing to cough or whatever. So two, two lessons here. Don't be secret. Talk about what you're doing. Um, release your code in open source if you want. Uh, and the second lesson is don't be hypnotized by biology. It's good to, be, to get some inspiration from it, but you have to understand the principles behind uh, the, you know, the processes that biology uses. If you just try to copy biology without, without understanding, um, it's not going to work. It's not a good engineering approach. Um, so, okay, so why, you know, why do we need those layers? Uh, there, are, there are theorems that will tell you, uh, tell, tell us that you can, you know, whenever you have a function composed of multiple layers, you can always reduce it to two layers, you know, in case of Boolean function, you can reduce it to disjunctive normal form or conjunctive normal form, and that's just two layers, ands and ors. Um, so why, why do we need multiple layers? In fact, when I you know, a few years ago when I was talking to uh, my friend Vladimir Vatnik, um, he had a very hard time understanding why we would need more layers because, you know, you can approximate any function you want with two layers. And the reason is efficiency. It's the same reason why when you write a program, every program you write that has kind of handles of finite input could in principle be written as a lookup table. You just pre-compute all possible, for all possible inputs, you pre-compute all, out all outputs and you're done, right? Now you store this in a table and you just index in the table. That table, unfortunately, the size of that table grows exponentially with the, num with the uh, size of the input. It goes linearly with the number of configurations, input configurations, that's exponential in the number of, uh, of input variables, if they're binary, let's say. So it's impractical for large inputs. And for large inputs, what we do is that we actually write a program and a, pro a program has uh, a sequential nature of it. So there were, we, we, we're able to reduce the exponential size of memory that we require by writing a program that requires several steps. We exchange space for time. So it's the same with deep learning. We uh, exchange space for time. Instead of limiting ourselves to two layers, we allow ourselves multiple layers. Okay, so what are good features? Since we're gonna build feature extractors and try to train them, um, how do we characterize good features? So there is this sense that natural data lies in the low-dimensional manifold in the high-dimensional ambient space. So if I take pictures of, uh, uh, to take a random example, say Michel Coupri right here, and ask him to make faces and turn his head around, and I take pictures of, of him with my, uh, you know, 10 megapixel cell phone camera, um, I'm gonna get 30 million numbers every time I take a picture. And so his face is a vector in a 30 million dimensional space. But, but the manifold on which all the possible images of his face making, you know, making uh, funny faces uh, lies is bounded above by the number of muscles in his face. Uh, that's the number of degrees of freedom, and I don't know how many you have. You know, for most of us it's 50, but maybe for you. Um, it's around 50. Um, so it's not gonna look like this you know, beautiful Calibiao manifold or anything, but um, but it's gonna be some sort of low dimensional manifold in a high dimensional space. So how do we kind of capture this? And so what we'd like is have sort of elementary, uh, what we call the uh, independent explanatory factors of variations on this manifold. So we'd like a number of variables that, explain, that tell us where we are on this manifold, or if we're outside the manifold, you know, in which direction uh, do we have to go to get closer to the manifold? And those essentially would explain all the data uh, that, we are, that we're facing. So there's an old trick to uh, try to do this, which uh, you know, people have used in, in, in various contexts uh, for pattern recognition in general. And the basic sequence of operations is you take your input, you expand its dimension using a nonlinear operation. And this is going to kind of refer back to the traditional architecture of, of object recognition systems or pattern recognition systems, where there is this middle uh, uh, module that expands the dimension in a nonlinear way. So you have nonlinear function that expands the dimension. Generally, it produces a sparse vector, but not always. It's not a requirement, it's just convenient. And then there is another step that aggregates. So the, the role of the first step is to kind of break apart uh, in, the, in this high dimensional space, separate things that need to be separated, uh, break apart things that are symmetrically different. And then the second one kind of glues the pieces back together that need to be glued to, together because they are symmetrically similar. Let me take a concrete example. So let's say we have uh, images of threes and images of eight, and here I've you know, put them in kind of a two-dimensional space. In, in reality, they would be a higher dimensional space. The threes and the eights in the same orientation are very close to each other because most of the pixels are common. 
And so those two manifolds of threes and eights that are rotated are very close to each other. I can't easily separate them. Um, so what I can do is I can do something like vector quantization, k-means algorithm, clustering. And uh, what I've represented in the middle here is six clusters. Uh, and they are labeled with the patterns that actually belong to each of these, those six clusters. So when I show a, uh, a, a sample, I show a point in that space, I figure out which prototype is closest to, and then I set the corresponding component among the six components of this six-dimensional vector. I set the corresponding one to one, and all the other ones to zero. Okay, so I get a sparse vector uh, composed of zeros and ones. And then the next step is, you can think of it as an OR gate that says, well, if this component, that component, or that component are on, then the output is on. Uh, and you could think of this as weights, linear weights and the threshold or something like this, so a linear classifier essentially. Um, and, and those will glue the pieces back together. All the threes will be glued back together and the eights will be glued back together. That's a tr traditional way of building pattern recognition systems and we're gonna use it to build feature extractors essentially. And so that's what our systems are gonna look like. Uh, they're gonna be composed of a sequence of modules each, uh, or stages. Each stage is composed of four layers uh, the first one, which is optional, does some sort of normalization. The second one is a filter bank, so it's a linear operator that expands the dimension of the input. Uh, so in the case of images, it will be a bunch of filters that we apply to the image. But if it's not an image, imagine just a big matrix that has more rows and it has columns, okay? So it expands the dimension. Then we apply a pointwise nonlinearity uh, to this. And the pointwise nonlinearity we generally apply now in modern uh, systems of this type is the so-called ReLU rectify linear unit, so it's essentially the positive part, nonlinearity, which uh, gives you zero if the argument is negative and uh, the, it's the identity if the argument is positive. The reason why this uh, nonlinearity can be pointwise or should be pointwise, uh, there are good mathematical arguments for this, uh, which I'm not gonna go into, but if you're interested in this, you can ask Jean Brunard, who is sitting here, who has the whole mathematical theory for why it has to be pointwise. Um, and, and then it's followed by feature pooling. Uh, generally, we build this by hand. It's a very simple operation that takes the response of some filters and aggregate them using a, like a max or an average or L2 norm or something like that. So that's one module. And we're gonna repeat this multiple times. And the learning is gonna apply to the, the filter banks, the coefficients in the filters or the, the linear operation that we put there. That's where learning takes place. Um, so, <clears throat> Uh, so the, the, uh, the, you could think, in fact, of, of this architecture as a succession of maxes. The, there, there are linear operations interspersed with max operations. So the, uh, the pooling generally is a max pooling, so it, does, it computes a max over uh, a number of different responses. But the ReLU, you can think of it as a max too, is the max of x and zero. And so you could think of the entire network as a bunch of linear transforms and then max operations. Um, and maxes are kind of like switches, if you want, that kind of turn, you know, kind of route things uh, or turn them on or off. Uh, so we're going to uh, train this with, uh, indeed, as uh, Laurent mentioned, an algorithm called uh, backpropagation, which is something um, I sort of independently came up with while I was a student at uh, SEA uh, and sort of developed during my, uh, my PhD. Uh, but other people in the world were kind of working on, this, on the same idea. And we sort of all more or less published our papers at the same time. Um, mine was unfortunately a very badly written paper in an obscure conference written in French and, but, um, but I was lucky enough that uh, the other guy who was working on this, Jeff Hinton, uh, actually uh, attended that conference as an invited speaker and saw the paper and sort of vaguely understood French and figured out it was the same thing. So uh, cited me in his paper. Um, but that was kind of an accident. Um, so the basic idea of backpropagation is very simple. It's a very sophisticated and horribly complicated application of an incredibly sophisticated mathematical concept called chain rule. Um, uh, derivation des fonctions composées in French. Um, you know, it's incredibly simple. It's something you learn in high school. And uh, it's, it's the basic idea that if you have a function that is composed of a sequence of uh, of, of functions, essentially a, a composition of multiple functions, to compute the gradient of some cost function, some objective function with respect to parameters, the parameters of those functions, uh, you can do it by backpropagating gradient through by essentially multiplying the gradient coming from the top by the Jacobian of each box and kind of working your way backwards. So I'm going to go to details of this. So one on algorithm has been around for 30 years, but um, it's incredibly powerful, and people did not believe really how powerful it could be. 
Um, when you train uh, multi-layer networks with backprop, wh what you have to optimize is non-convex functions. And somehow, a lot of people in machine learning are very um, uncomfortable with minimizing non-convex functions. However, it turns out for the type of uh, networks that we're talking about, the, the functions have interesting properties that makes them particularly easy to, uh, to optimize, even though they are very highly non-convex. I'm not going to go into the details of this. It would take me too long. So I'm going to quickly flash through the slides without seeing a word about them, except for the fact that there, are, there is interesting mathematics to do about this that has to do with random matrix theory. And since I know there is random matrix theory people uh, at the LabEx Bezu, I just wanted to mention that. OK, so here's a particular example of, um, of these deep architectures that uh, I, I worked on primarily. I started when uh, I was a, a postdoc at the University of Toronto with Jeff Hinton and then developed this uh, while I was at Bell Labs uh, in the late 80s and early 90s. And the basic idea of uh, convolutional net is, is essentially to implement this principle um, I, I talked about earlier, but apply this to images, or at least to uh, data that comes to you in the form of an array. So either an image or a time frequency representation for, uh, for speech, or even a sequence of words or a sequence of letters for, uh, for text. So anything that comes to you in the form of an array where the statistics don't change as you move around, as you move around this array, first of all. And second of all, where there are um, uh, high degrees of correlations between nearby variables, which is the case for images. Nearby pixels are highly correlated in images. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, we're going to take an image and we're going to pass it through uh, multiple filters, in this case, four filters here. And we're going to get those uh, feature maps here, the four feature maps that we see uh, in the first, uh, first layer. Those feature maps are going to be passed through a nonlinearity. In this particular case, it's a sigmoid. It's not a ReLU, but the result is similar. And then the next operation up is to take a neighborhood um, of uh, the response of, of, of each of those filters and basically aggregate the values, in this case using an average, but uh, in more modern, modern implementations, we use a max. Uh, this conditional net is, you know, goes back to the late 80s, early 90s. Um, so the convolution, so the, the, uh, the, the filter is really, uh, performs a convolution operation. As you see on the lower right, uh, we take the input image, we take a convolution kernel, which you can think of as just a little square of, of weights. We compute the dot product between those weights and a window over the input that gives us uh, a value uh, on, the, on the corresponding feature map. And then we slide this window over for all possible locations. And so we get an image as a result. And that's just a discrete convolution. So that's why those networks are called convolutional nets. Right, OK, so we have uh, this convolution, a nonlinearity, and then the pooling, which uh, computes the average or the max of a patch of pixels, in the case two by two. And then we, the pooling is subsampled. So we move the window by two pixels or more than one pixels. OK, the stride is, is more than one. So the result is that the, the second layer has lower resolution than the first layer, in this case, by a factor of two. That's the first stage. And now we repeat the operation. So at the next, uh, uh, next layer up, each feature map is the result of applying a bunch of filters to each of the feature maps of the previous layers and adding the results. OK, so it, it detects conjunctions of features from the various feature maps. Passing this to a nonlinearity and again going through pooling and subsampling and then to a couple more layers that are just uh, linear uh, and values. Um, so the idea for architectures like this, in fact, um, uh, go back to the neocognitron model by a gentleman called Kuniko Fukushima. He is not radioactive, as far as I know. Um, I met him a couple of times, although that was before. But um, he, he came up with uh, kind of a computer model that was based on this idea of sort of local filters that, that went through nonlinearity and were pooled. He didn't quite have the right learning algorithm, so he had to come up to, to devise some sort of unsupervised learning algorithm to train his system. Um, but he was inspired himself by classic work in neuroscience from the 60s by Hubel and Wiesel. This is Nobel Prize winning work on the architecture of the visual cortex, where um, these guys identified uh, things called simple cells, which are very similar to the, the first layer I was talking about. And complex cells are very similar to the aggregation uh, units I was talking about as well. And so he got some success at doing simple tasks like recognizing simple letters and things like that. But I was, I was very impressed by that paper. I immediately found what was wrong with it, which was the running algorithm, and tried to come up with a better one. And that, that's how Backprop came, uh, came around. So um, 
So we train this with stochastic gradient descent and various uh, uh, optimization algorithms. And this is an example of kind of a vintage convolutional net in action. Uh, this is from the early 90s. And so you see the, the various uh, feature maps and the resolution going down as you go up the layers due to the pooling and the, the stride larger than one, the subsampling. Um, and as you go up the layers, the features get more and more abstract, if you want. Um, so those things have been applied, as, as Laurent mentioned, they've, they've been applied to things like uh, check recognition and things like this since the 90s, uh, including in commercial applications. Um, but in recent years, people have managed to make fast implementations of those networks on uh, GPU uh, cars. And that allowed us to train very, very large networks. The very early networks that I trained at Bell Labs had on the order of 400 million, uh, sorry, 400,000 uh, connections and a few tens of thousands of parameters. Uh, we couldn't afford to do more because the machines we had at, at you know, the power of the time, it was the biggest machine we can get, but it was still limited. And it would take you know, a couple of weeks to train. Um, interestingly enough, it still takes a couple of weeks to train the networks, but now they are gigantic, gigantic compared to uh, those old models. And, um, and they're trained on much more data. So last year, uh, two years ago actually, well, in, in October 2012, uh, Jeff Hinton, with two of his students, Alex Krzyzewski and Ilya Sutskever, participated in the so-called ImageNet uh, large-scale uh, visual recognition challenge, which is a competition in computer vision to do object recognition from images. So you're shown an image with kind of a dominant object in it, and the system is supposed to tell you, uh, to give you five answers as to what the object is. And if the correct answer is in the five answers, then uh, you win. Otherwise, it's, a, it's an error. And so they designed this convolutional net very much, very similar to the one I, I, I had worked on for the last uh, uh, 20 some odd years. Um, uh, but it was just much bigger. 60 million parameters, 800 mi uh, million uh, connections, synapses if you, want, if you want to call them this way. And very deep, many, many layers, using those ReLUs and max pooling. And if you train this supervised, just with regular backprop, uh, you get those beautiful filters at the first layer. Uh, some of which are oriented edge detectors, like Gabor filters. Some of them detect uh, uh, color contrast. And they look very much like what uh, we know some neurons are doing in the area V1 of the, of the visual cortex in, uh, in mammals. Um, and, and Jeff uh, said this joke in his NIPS talk. Uh, uh, you know, to train it, use all the tricks Ian came up with in the last 20 years, and then add dropout, which is a regularization method that he came up with a couple of years earlier. Um, so it was a bit of a, a watershed. Uh, I shouldn't use this word here. It was a bit of a um, um, revolution, if you want, in computer vision, because the performance of the system was much, much better than uh, you know, what was there before. So the competing systems had on the order of 25% error, and this system got down to about 15% error on this ImageNet data set. And it's, creating a, it's created a re revolution in the sense that there's been a revolution in industry where all the web companies basically jumped on the occasion to uh, implement systems like this to do image tagging within the space of a few months. Um, and at the same time, uh, the uh, academic community, uh, which was very skeptical about those techniques before that, essentially jumped on it. And in the new, the latest competition, essentially all the participants use convolutional nets. So we went from one to everybody in less than one year. Um, so in the space of a few months, uh, Jeff and, and his students uh, essentially sold themselves to Google um, and uh, kind of the way I sold myself to Facebook. And um, in the space of a few months, Google deployed a photo tagging system based on convolutional nets that did a pretty good job. So I applied this to my Google Plus photo collection. I type bird, and I get a whole bunch of birds, and I get uh, baby birds, and I get octopus that look like baby birds, and radio-controlled airplanes that are close enough to birds, and, um, and then Sami Benjo. And it's kind of weird because Sami Benjo is actually one of the people who at Google works on image recognition. So it's suspicious. <laughs> he promised me it's actually not an Easter egg. So here's another network of this type. This is one that we built in my lab. Uh, it wasn't ready for the 2012 uh, competition. We entered it in a 2013 competition uh, with my former student, Pierre Sermanet. And 
this system got um, a little better performance at Alex Krzyzewski's network, and it won the so-called classification plus localization competition in the ImageNet uh, Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge, and it came third in the detection um, uh, competition behind two other convolutional nets with, combined with other methods. But then in the space of two weeks after the deadline, we actually managed to uh, get the best performance of, of them all. And since then, another group from Berkeley also got better performance. Uh, you can actually download this code and play with it. It's called Overfeet. Uh, that's a bit of a play on words here. Uh, so if you, if you search Overfeet NYU, you'll, you'll find uh, the code. And you can just run it. It will extract features or recognize objects if you give it an image. You can use it as a feature extractor to a pre-trained. -pre um, so you get sort of the same kind of features that uh, Hinton and his students were getting. Uh, these are the, the latest uh, ImageNet competition results. Uh, the, um, the teams that are uh, circled here are all from NYU. So this is the overfeed system, which was really designed to do localization more than classification. This is the classification competition. This is Matt Zeter and Rob Fergus. Rob Fergus is a colleague. Matt Zeter, a former student of his. And after Matt Zeter graduated, he started a small company called Clarify and kind of refined the system and trained it more and tuned it and managed to actually win that competition. Uh, but it's actually, you know, basically from, from 13 to, 12, to 11, it's just, you know, more training and more tuning and bigger networks. Um, so a slightly more complicated task is to localize, so to figure out, you know, not just what object is in the image, but where it is and put a bounding box around it. And it can do a pretty good job at this, uh, you know, localizing uh, white walls and things like this. Um, and we won that competition uh, according to some measure, which is the mean average precision, which I'm not going to go into the details of. Uh, uh, admittedly, not, very, not many, very many teams participated in this one. Um, and one of the ways that we do classification, localization, and uh, later, as I'll show, detection is we use a kind of a sliding window approach. So you can think of the convolutional net as applied to an image and then producing just one output. But you can actually make the input bigger and then replicate the output as well. The only thing you get is a bigger convolutional net where every layer is convolutional, including the output. And what you get is a map of response. It's kind of a heat map for every category over the input. And it's the result of, it's equivalent to applying the convolutional net with a, with a sliding window over the input. So what you do is you, you take the image and you, uh, you make a, a pyramid out of it, a multi-resolution pyramid by subsampling it at various ratio, and then you apply the convolutional net with a sliding window. Uh, the, the size of the window is fixed uh, over all of those things. And then you record the, the kind of heat map out of this for all the categories. And then you do some sort of non-maximum suppression voting. And at the end, you get, uh, um, uh, you know, you get kind of a a high score for where the identified object uh, is. In the system that we have here, there is an extra set of outputs to the network that predict the location of the bounding box. And so um, each window, so if there's a window that's centered on the, on the head of the bear in this image, it will tell you, I think the bear is here. I can't see the whole bear, but I see its head and I see its neck, so I know the bounding box should be here. So it predicts the bounding box even if it doesn't see the entire object. And so these are all the bounding boxes that are voted by the system. Um, after they've been kind of drawn in the right place. And you see there's a lot of windows around the bear, and we just combine them and get a high score for the bear. Um, and it works for all kinds of different funny animals and breeds of dogs, and also for uh, burritos. Works very well for burritos. You can detect burritos. So this is a detection issue here where there might be several objects in the image, and the system is supposed to tag every object with a, with a bounding box. Um, so it works well for birds, for burritos, uh, for uh, you know screens, but it's probably the first example of a sexist uh, convolutional net. It's supposed to detect the person, but seems to only focus on the miniskirt. Uh, and also it misses other objects, like the remote control, which you can barely see. Um, so these are the, the results of this detection co competition, which I'm not going to go into. The other teams that did pretty well are from uh, uh, University of Amsterdam and from NEC in uh, California. So this uh, works pretty well. This has 200 categories. I, I forgot to mention the classification uh, problem had 1,000 categories. That includes obscure breeds of dogs and things like that. Uh, the detection task has 200 categories. Uh, but it can do a relatively good job at... Uh, 
distinguishing wet sheep from wet dogs and people of various kinds and dogs and French horns and, you know, unexpected combinations of stuff. Um, okay, um, let me skip ahead to interest the time. Uh, you can also distinguish cats from dogs, which is great for me because that means we can have a cat detector uh, on the web and eliminate every single picture of cats on the internet. Um, so I, I kind of mentioned the idea at Facebook and they say, are you crazy? Like, you take all the cat pictures out of Facebook? What's left? Um, so uh, another application, so there are other applications of conventional nets, some of which have to do with images, some of which have to do with other signals that come to you in the form of an array. So a good example is face recognition. So this is a work that takes place at Facebook AI Research in my new lab at uh, Facebook, but I'm not involved in it. I'm not a co-author on the paper. Um, this is uh, by uh, Yaniv Tagman and uh, Ming Yang, primarily. And, and what they've done is they've uh, uh, built a, a system where you take the, if you, you, you run a phase detector on an image. So an image you would upload to Facebook, for example, uh, a phase detector is run, uh, face are detected, and then a model is, is, is applied to the face, a, 3D, a kind of 3D model is applied to the face to figure out uh, you know, after detection of the key uh, uh, features of the face, like the eyes and mouth and stuff like that, and it's to figure out, you know, how how would the lay, what would the face look like if we were to see it from the frontal view? And so after this 3D, uh, 3D model is, is fit, we can kind of rectify the view so so that we have a picture that would appear as if the the photo had been taken from the from the front, and then you take that picture and send it to a convolutional net, a relatively big convolutional net, and it basically performs at uh, human uh, performance level. It's almost as good as humans. And, and so that's, that's a, a pretty amazing result. In fact, uh, some of you may have heard um, about the system through the French press. There were a few articles in the Journal du Dimanche, and uh, I think there was a discussion on Canal Plus on you know, how this system is uh, scary because it's going to you know, spy on everybody, etc. cetera. Uh, first of all, it's not actually turned on in France. Um, second, uh, it's actually designed to protect uh, the privacy of Facebook users. So it can alert you when the picture of you has been uploaded on Facebook by someone, including by someone you don't know. And so you can control whether that picture should be distributed or not. And so it's actually for privacy protection that this is useful. It's also useful for users. You know, you take a picture of your friends, and you know you don't have to tag everybody. They're tagged automatically, but the tag will not appear unless the person who is tagged ag agrees to it. So uh, there's no privacy invasion there. And this is not going to be sold to the NSA or the police or whatever. Uh, it's internal technology. Um, so this works really well. Uh, there are other applications for uh, things like pose estimation. Uh, maybe if I have time, I'll show you a, a, a video of this later. Um, and more recently, um, uh, a group from uh, uh, Sweden, uh, from KTH in Sweden, took the overfeed system and used it as a feature extractor and retrained the classifier on a whole bunch of different tasks, vision, vision tasks. And they essentially got state-of-the-art performance on every single task that they tried it on. So even if you don't retrain it, just the overfeed uh, feature is not retrained, just use it as a feature extractor, replacing SIFT, for example, um, essentially gives you state-of-the-art uh, performance on just about any visual recognition task you can imagine. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire list, but I mean there are a few for which it's competitive, a, a few where it's above state of the art, you know, above the previous state of the art. Uh, it's uh, it's very impressive, and I'm thankful to them for having run through this um, uh, whole list of things. There's a whole a bunch of applications, in fact, for which we know um, uh, conventional nets actually are the best uh, methods. Uh, so rather than bore you with uh, details. I'm going to show you a video, a, not a video, a demo of that system in action. Okay, so I have this gigantic laptop here. Oops, and I forgot to plug my machine, and so it's run slow. Okay, so you see how the frame rate just increased from four frames, two frames per second to eight? It's because I just plugged the machine in, so now the GPU is all pumped up and happy. And, and running like, like crazy. So I have this webcam, and I can point the webcam at any object, and it's going to tell me what the object is. So here, that's a handheld notebook computer, desktop computer, handheld computer, notebook. 
uh, space bar. Yeah, that's a space bar. Uh, let's see. Digital watch. That's a digital watch. What is this? A oscilloscope. Yeah, it's close enough, you know. <laughs> uh, it knows it's a screen. Uh, let's, try, let's try that. If I can hold it. Water bottle. Okay. That's a water bottle. This unidentified microphone. Here we go. Um, what is that? Press on it. That's horrible. It doesn't know what this is. How about that? Uh, no, it doesn't know what this is either. <laughs> uh, okay, let me try this. Uh, I have to uh, loafer. Okay, that's correct. So loafer is correct. That's the you know a type of shoe for you, those of you who don't know. So you get the idea. Uh, shoe shop? No. <laughs> Stage. Okay, that's more like it, but not really. Baseball player. You know, it's red. Stage. Yeah, it, it, it has to do with some some sort of theater of some kind. Sliding door. Spotlight. How about spotlights? No, I don't know. Yeah, it doesn't know what this is. The screen is too large. But um, so you get the idea. So that's one uh, one demo. Here's another one. It's essentially the same system. Oh, I know what I forgot. A cell phone. But that's okay. Okay. So this one I can train. So this one I can point it at an object uh, and say uh, that's, uh, for example, a table. And I'm going to just click on this learn button. And every time I click on the button, it registers a template for the object at the top of the network. So essentially, the top layer of the network has been removed. And we replace it with a very simple classifier. It's actually a Parson Windows classifier, for those of you who know what this is. So now it knows what this table is. Um, let's try with the chair. So OK, so it knows about the chair, knows about the table. Um, We'll try with the screen here. That would be number three. Number three. Okay, so we have the screen, the table, the chair, uh, and then you guys on the left are going to be class D, and you guys in the middle are going to be E. Okay, remember who you are. And on the right here, you're going to be. F. Okay, you are F, uh, and you look like D a little bit. You are E. I need to keep this still. You are D. A screen, a table, and a chair. And I'm gonna have to use myself. This is this is Jan. And so the number that you see at the, at the right of the learn button is the number of samples that I uh, use to train the system. So with just a few samples, it can recognize, you know, it's not, they're not categories, but you know, here the, the, the look is very similar from, for this and for, 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 for that, and somehow sort of makes a difference, more or less. Uh, doesn't know about you anymore, somehow. Yeah. And that's so good for that. So you get the idea here with, you know, I can train this thing with just a few examples and lots of categories. And that was a critique that people had said about uh, uh, convolutional nets, which is that they require a lot of samples to train. And in fact, this system has been trained with 1.5 million samples of images from 1,000 categories. So yes, they require a lot of samples. They strive on samples. They work really well on samples. It's, uh, that's why you're only hearing about this now. You didn't hear about this. Uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago because we didn't have large enough data sets with labeled images that we could use. Also, we didn't have computers that were fast enough. Um, and so the fact, you know, th those systems really kind of work better with large, large data sets, uh, which is why, you know, companies like Google and Facebook really love them because we have tons of data. Um, 
Another thing I want to show you is this um, hand pose uh, recognition. So this is again a convolutional net which is uh, applied to uh, uh, pose recovery. So you can you so this is running in real time here. So it's real time puppeteering. Is a, a depth image captured uh, from a depth camera, uh, similar to a Kinect. And what you see on the screen is a synthesized image of a hand following the pose of the, of the real hand. Um, and so the hand is detected in some ways, and then there is, uh, the a convolutional net is, is trained to produce heat maps for each of the knuckles, uh, key points. And uh, let me skip ahead a little bit. So these are the, the heat maps that are produced for each of the, the key points. And then there is sort of a 3D model, skeletal model of a hand that uh, does inverse kinematics to reconstruct the entire pose. And, um, and this, works, this works really well. This is, this is real time running on the GPU with a latency of about 30 milliseconds. So it's really a video rate. So that's really cool. Uh, this work is uh, done uh, mostly by uh, um, Jonathan Thompson, who is at NYU. He's not a student with me, he's a student with uh, Chris Bergler and Ken Perlin, and this is the system running. Uh, okay, how much time do I have now? A couple of minutes, okay. So that'll be enough to uh, talk about stuff that um, we've done in collaboration with uh, Laurent Ajman, who's here, Camille Coupri. Uh, and Clément Farabet, who is uh, a student with Laurent working in my lab uh, as well, on semantic segmentation. So this is a, a problem. Uh, here the problem is not to identify objects, but to label every pixel in an image with the category of the objects it belongs to. Okay, so it's the, in, a, in a way, that's the ultimate computer vision task, right? If you can do this, you can do everything. Uh, of course, we don't have data with fine-grained uh, categories for this. Uh, there's only a few data sets that are available, and they have only a couple thousand images that we can train on. Um, but this is a few years old, and we managed to train a convolutional net, a multi-scale convolutional net, to do that job there. So this convolutional net actually looks at a pyramid of images, and there are three copies of the of three, three identical copies of the same convolutional net with the same weights applied to the three images at different sizes. Um, and uh, the, um, the, feature, the feature maps produced by the low resolution versions are up, upsampled so that they're concatenated with the high resolution versions. And what you see in the end is that uh, a particular category uh, detector on the output is influenced by a 46 by 46 window on the high resolution input and also a 46 by 46 window on the lower resolution input and a 46 by 46 window on the small resolution input. And so the result is that to make a decision, the system is able to not just look at uh, a, a small context window, but to look at essentially the entire image. So to figure out if a gray pixel is from uh, the road or you know, someone's shirt or a cloud in the sky, it, it's able to take the entire image into account to make that decision. And that's really what makes this work. Uh, there's a, bit, a little bit of post-processing going on there in the system I'm going to talk about. It's very simple. It's basically a majority vote over super pixels. Uh, we tried more sophisticated things that actually work better, but only marginally, and are, are a lot slower. And with this, we essentially beat, beat the, the state of the art, um, at least in the class accuracy um, measure, which is, um, is somewhat more relevant than the pixel, ac pixel wise accuracy. And so we get uh, on the order of 74.5 uh, uh, correct with the system, and it runs in less than a second on the standard laptop. Uh, whereas previous systems that uh, are comparable uh, take about 100 times uh, more time, if not more. Uh, so this is very, um, very interesting. We tried this on other data sets, like the CFLOW data set, which has 33 categories. Uh, and there again, we, we, uh, we beat the state of the art pretty, pretty badly. Uh, this was the previous state of the art at 30%. Uh, our system gets over 50% correct. Um, so this works quite well, and I'll skip ahead to the uh, video because that's fun. So here we have someone biking down uh, a street in Manhattan. In fact, this is very close to, uh, to, our NYU, to my NYU lab. He's wearing a helmet with, uh, not with horns, but with USB cameras on it. It looks like horns, but okay. Uh, and, and we run the uh, uh, semantic segmentation system, which is essentially a sliding window conversion net, as, as you saw, frame by frame. So there's no uh, 
temporal consistency here. And it makes stupid mistakes like those, those uh, beige areas here, it says it's, it's a beach. Uh, this is the middle of Manhattan, I guarantee there's no beach. Uh, unless you believe, you know, sous les pavés la plage, but, um, but it works okay, uh, just, you know, ex except for those stupid mistakes. Um, uh, Camille, when she was a postdoc in my lab, worked on uh, uh, kind of including temporal consistency on this, uh, on this system. And so essentially doing 3D uh, segmentation, but still using kind of frame by frame features extracted by the conventional net. Uh, and that's, uh, that sort of cleans up the result uh, quite a bit. Um, and this is actually the actual speed at which the system runs. Uh, so we kind of slowed down the video to the speed at which it actually runs. Uh, this was published in um, ICLR last year, ICIP also. There is an upcoming paper in JMLR. Uh, Camille also worked on a version of the system that works from RGBD images, uh, which were connected by, collected at NYU by uh, Nathan Silberman, who is pictured here, and got really good results on um, uh, identifying objects in, in sort of indoor scenes. So uh, in the interest of time, I think I'm running out. I'm going to skip ahead and uh, just mention the fact that we actually have uh, hardware to implement those things fast that run, um, uh, that could eventually be turned into a, uh, a custom chip that would consume a fraction of a watt, maybe a tenth of a watt or something like this. The prototype that we built, uh, which unfortunately uh, could not be built properly, uh, would, would consume half a watt. And we have enough power to run this uh, segmentation system in real time at about uh, uh, 20 frames per second. So the idea that uh, somehow within uh, 10 years, the chips that you will have in your, in your cell phones will be able to do uh, solve complex vision tasks, like say driving your car, uh, is completely possible. Um, I'm gonna have to stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Uh, while uh, I take questions, I'll show a, a video of a mobile robot project that, who's uh, you know, driven by vision that uses conventional nets for its, uh, as its main vision system. So we're running a bit, it's working or no? Yes. yes. We're running a bit late, but we'll start a bit, we'll shift the schedule a little bit. We have a bit of slack. Uh, we'll take a couple of uh, questions. So if you have questions, please raise your hand. Hello, Jan. Um, would you have any type of advice for uh, people that are designing sensors? Uh, I, I could see from the very end of your presentation that you had a camera that would essentially use a normal lens and essentially have uh, things on the electronic sides do most of the, the work. But if you were uh, tempted to have something else than a normal lens, something like hyperspectral and so forth, something a little bit more complex, uh, would you have any type of uh, advice to the generic uh, sensor maker? Right. So, I mean, there are, there, there's certainly a lot of tasks that are much, much easier to solve when you have, say, depth uh, sensors or hyperspectral uh, sensors, just because, you know, it gives you more data. So it's a trick that insects use. So insects tend to have, or, or some animals like, uh, uh, like shrimp, uh, some type of shrimps, for example, have hyperspectral uh, eyes but very low spatial resolution. But somehow it's better for them to detect craze. So yeah, uh, I mean, it allows to reduce the amount of brain power you need to, to analyze the, the signal. Uh, so I imagine that there are a lot of uh, tasks that would be easier to solve with uh, different types of sensors. So a good example, for example, is the, uh, the Google uh, self-driving car, which does not use cameras right now. Um, they're working on it, but the, right now it's m mostly using a LiDAR, which is just a depth sensor. So it's much easier to do uh, collision avoidance when you have a depth sensor. Uh, the problem, of course, is that the, the sensor itself is about twice the price of the car it's mounted on, so it's not practical, really. But um, also, when every car in the streets have you know, infrared lasers shooting at each other, uh, they're going to start interfering and fry your eyes, probably. So um, you know, probably not good. Other questions? 
know. It seems like there is no limit to these uh, capabilities of detecting objects and uh, the images. Do you think one day we will have a perfect system that will be able to look at everything, understanding everything? So by perfect, you mean as good as humans? Yes. Uh, okay, <laughs> so humans are very, very far from perfect. These are all kinds of optical illusions. You can fool humans in all kinds of ways. Uh, we, have, we have the feeling that our, the kind of wrong impression that our visual system somehow is you know, omnipotent, right? We can recognize anything there is to recognize, see everything there is to see. But in fact, uh, psychophysicists know very well that there is lots of, lots of things we're blind to. Uh, because of attention, because basically the bandwidth of our visual system is very limited. We have high resolution vision only in a very, very fine uh, area in the middle of a visual field. And on the side, uh, we get the impression that we can recognize objects, but we can't. Uh, if you put your hand on the side like this and at, you know, 90 degrees or something, and you try to count how many fingers you have, you can't. You can't even resolve the fingers. Uh, and you can't recognize objects when they're far away. So. Uh, you know, I didn't answer the question, but uh, you know, how long will it take us to get human performance? I think on, on uh, certain tasks like face recognition, we're very close. On um, object recognition, we're actually getting pretty close, in fact, good, in the sense that our systems now can identify obscure breeds of dogs that I, I don't know anything about. Like, do, you know, do you guys know what a Samoyed is? It's a breed of dog, and this system, uh, the system I showed you, the demo, can do a very good job at picking out Samoyed, which are white wolf-like dogs from white wolves and from huskies and from other kinds of dogs that look the same. Um, with your, uh, your example of the, yeah, come here. Oh, yeah. Uh, with your example of the, um, of the airplanes, you, you said we have to find an equivalent of uh, aerodynamics uh, for intelligence? Do, do you think we, we have found it for vision at least? No, we haven't. Uh, so I don't think we've, we've found kind of the ultimate principle for, for learning. We have learning algorithms that work for supervised learning that are okay. They're not perfect, but they're okay. Uh, we have a small number of uh, unsupervised learning algorithms that can do a decent job, but every, none of us believe that we have the ultimate answer for unsupervised learning. And it's, true, it's, it's, it's the case that most learning uh, in the brain is unsupervised in nature. You know, we, uh, we, uh, we learn about the structure of the world by basically moving around in the world and looking at it, uh, not by being told the name of every object. And so that we don't know how to do properly yet. Uh, two questions. Um, one was when you were training to recognize things around you, just with three examples of each class, how many parameters are you learning? It seems strange that, I, I assume you have many more than three parameters that you're learning, but it seems strange that you can tweak so many parameters when you have much fewer examples. And the second question is, um, just to go back to the optimization of non-convex, of the non-convex error surface, is there some kind of small intuition you can provide as to why with convolutions, local optimization works really well? Okay, so answer the f uh, f first, first question. Um, uh, let, me, let, me, let me answer the second question first. Okay, so f the uh, optimization uh, is simple because um, uh, there are results from random matrix theory that seem to suggest that when you have, when you build those systems, the function you're trying to optimize is akin to a, a polynomial on the sphere and a high, high dimensional polynomial on the sphere, high degree polynomial with lots of mono monomials on the sphere. And the properties of the critical points, which are saddle points, minima, and maxima, of those uh, polynomials on the sphere are relatively well analyzed by people who've traditionally worked on things like spin glass and stuff like that, spin glass theory, in the random matrix uh, theory. And what, what is known is that um, the, the minima are, are clustered within a very, very small, narrow band of energies. And so uh, if you just take a, if you have a process that's going to find a minimum, it's going to find a minimum which will basically be as good as any other minimum, right? The, the likelihood of being trapped in a bad minimum is actually relatively small because most of the minima, I mean, there's exponentially larger number of good minima than there are of, of bad minima. Now, of course, there is an even larger number of saddle points, so you have to figure out how to avoid saddle points, but you don't get, you know, you get slowed down by saddle points, you just don't get trapped into them. And now I forgot your first question. <laughs> Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. So 
there is not just three parameters. There's more parameters than, than, than that in the demo I showed. Uh, so the entire network, you know, the n minus one first layers are fixed. And then just the last layer is retrained. And you can think of it as basically just a nearest neighbor classifier. Okay, so every time I click on the learn button, I store a template of the last uh, feature vector, which has 4,000 dimensions. So I store a 4,000 dimensional vector. In a, in a way, that's 4,000 parameters right there, right? And every time I click the learn button, I store another vector of 4,000 dimensions. And then for the classification, I just, you know, compare, compare them all. It's, you know, it's actually, you know, the gets on windows and I compute scores using pars on window, but it's, it's really just like nearest neighbors. All right, so we're running uh, out of time, so we'll stop with the questions now. Uh, let's thank Jan uh, one more time. So uh, we'll take a coffee break until uh, quarter past 11. I want to remind you that if you don't have your badge yet, uh, please go and, and collect it because uh, uh, it contains